Kia ora koutou. I think we'll, we'll get started. It's wonderful to see you all here. My name's Fiona Fields and I'm the Digital New Zealand Services Manager um, based at National Library, which is part of the Department of Internal Affairs. So this is uh, a panel today, clearly, with all these great people on stage. And we're looking at the progress and perspectives on opening up rights and licensing for cultural sector collections, which is a bit of a long title, but really um, one of my passions is making sure that people can easily understand how they can use digital content. And over the last several national digital forums, we've been talking about opening up our collection content and data and, and the barriers and the issues and all of those things that make it harder. And one of my goals in work, and to be brutally honest my, in my life, because I'm really passionate about my job, which is kind of sad, but um, is to make New Zealand digital content easy to find, easier to find, share and use. And one way that we do this at Digital New Zealand is to encourage our 150 or so content partners to be clear about how their content can be used. If it's all rights reserved, then make it really clear that that's the case, but preferably that content will be open or Creative Commons licensed or so forth. So we, we really encourage clear and open licensing so that people can use our search services to walk or to easily find New Zealand content that they can use in their art projects and in their work. So here in New Zealand, we have various things that are trying to encourage thing, openness on its way. So we've got New Zealand NZ Goal, the Government Open Access and Licensing Framework to help guide the way and more recently the Declaration on Open and Transparent Government to show, which shows the commitment the government has for actively re releasing high value data. And in the cultural sector there have been some really great inroads um, that have been made and, and that's what I want to show you today with um, some of the panellists that we have. So to date um, in Digital New Zealand we have about 300,000 items from our uh, various content partners that are licensed as what we call modifiable. They will have a, a Creative Commons or an open license in Digital New Zealand um, and that doesn't include the, also the wonderful behemoth that is Papers Past which expands that number actually to over 20 million items because Papers Past is so massive. But a lot of Papers Past is in the public domain because it's pre-1916. Um, and we've also in Digital New Zealand opened up a a chunk of metadata, metadata for commercial reuse so that um, vendors, um, library vendors and so forth can use that data or our developers can use that data to sell apps in an app store for example. But copyright and licensing issues are hard work. There's donor agreements, there's cultural and ethical issues, these things abound and um, but there is there is content out there that could be and should be in the public domain or there's content out there that, and data out there that we actually, our organisations hold the copyright to and could open for reuse. And licensing issues are tricky and scary to traverse and yes copyright and, and copyright and licensing requires back bravery and we've seen some examples of that here at NDF with the Rijksmuseum and Museums of Victoria being really brave and opening up their collection, their collection and content and data for others to use and just seeing what happens and building up the structures around it and going, starting the journey, starting the leap. So the aim of this panel is to explore that journey and the progress and the results from a range of organisations and, and initiatives who have actually taken the leap to opening up data. So I've got some great um, examples um, of people to tell you about great examples. Um, importantly, we've also got a couple of perspectives from two key audiences, the publishing sector and the education sectors, to find out what difference um, and indeed what impact um, access to open cultural content and data has made for them. So we hope to show you some options for opening up licensing and access and inspire you to take that first leap or to take a longer leap towards opening up your content and data. So uh, today I've got six very talented and de dedicated people. Um, four have made significant progress in opening up their collection content for reuse or um, uh, are starting a journey to do that as well. And two, want to tell you why it's so important to them and their, their sectors. And I think we can learn a lot from them. So um, 
I'm going to let them introduce themselves. <laughs> um, so I'll start off with Victoria. Uh, hi everybody, um, uh, my name's Victoria Leachman, I'm the Rights Advisor here at Te Papa. And um, I thought the first thing I'd do is tell you our latest step. Um, Te Papa's latest statement of intent commits Te Papa to releasing for open reuse 10,000 high resolution images per year for the next three years, so 30,000. Um, really that's been um, a result of the revisioning process led by our CEO Michael Houlihan over the past two years. We've had the opportunity to look again at open reuse of collection images and during the revisioning there was a whole lot of discussion about Te Papa's mission. Our revisioning process determined a number of strategic priorities for Te Papa, including doing more to share our collections and knowledge and to share authority over those collections with individuals, communities and iwi. Open access obviously provides a key way we can do this, to share the collections and empower individuals and communities to use those collections in their own ways. And we certainly want our digital collections to be the start of something more. Um, so what that means for us is that the result of that is that Te Papa's new executive put the statement of intent in and, and really wants to include some of those measures to reflect this shift and that's one way of doing it and providing evidence that audiences were engaging with our collections in a meaningful way. Um, how we're you know, on the ground, people underneath the executive, we're seeing it as a stake in the ground and a mandate towards change, change towards making um, open reuse business as usual in our working process and building it into our website. Um, there's obviously some technical challenges with our site to overcome but it's the, it's due around March 2014. Now when I say open reuse at the moment that's um, for purely the public domain images at high resolution. Um, we have other material obviously, um, the stuff we own copyright in which will be available um, under Creative Commons non-commercial licences and then of course there's the stuff where there are other copyright or relationship issues which will stay all rights reserved. So that's our position at the moment. Next in the line, um, my name is Fiona Moorhead and I'm Assistant Registrar at Auckland Art Gallery. Um, it's interesting, I think you're going to get a whole spectrum of different responses here. Um, I think Auckland Art Gallery is sort of somewhere along the road of that journey of um, opening up content. Um, currently we have a collection of just over 15,000 artworks. Um, of that we've got just over 50% of our collection um, which is out of copyright, so copyright has um, expired. Um, we've actually found it really easy to identify um, items that we can release out as, um, as uh, copyright expired. We just go on the copyright laws, um, so 50 to 70 years after the death of the artist, um, depending on the country of origin. Um, of the remaining artworks in our collection, um, just over 5,500, um, we have copyright permission from the artist or copyright holder. Um, and obviously uh, reproductions occur through um, our reproduction service, so a request is made um, indicating how they'll use it um, and then they're able to use that content. Um, we do have a number of artworks that um, we do not have any copyright permission on. Those are the ones that um, when you visit our website you don't see an image at all. Um, they may be ones where the artist has stated that they don't want their um, artworks reproduced online. Um, or it may be artworks, um, for example, orphan works where we um, know that it's in copyright but we're un unable to find the copyright holder. Um, I think in summary, um, for Auckland Art Gallery, um, we find it easy to determine whether something is out of copyright. You know, it's just a simple um, a bit of maths and every year we release more um, artworks when they go out of copyright. I think the harder thing for us is um, what to do with orphan works and I definitely agree with um, Ali's statement, um, Ali from Museums Victoria, where she sort of said that that's really the difficult thing, but um, I'll pass on now. So that's a brief intro. I've got oh, two mics. Oh, two mics. That's too many. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Reed. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the Upper Hutt City Library Heritage Collections, of which we have a slide. Um, basically, we're like what you call community archives. We serve as the main repository for collecting and preserving items that document the history of Upper Hutt and its people. 
Um, we actually have a fairly substantial and varied collection of heritage resources that would be of interest to a far broader group of people than just our local community. However, the problem we've traditionally had, uh, like a lot of small, out-of-the-way, under-resourced archives of our kind, is that we've, tend to be very, we've tended to be very underutilized. Um, and so, second slide, uh, it has been as a way of getting around that problem that a couple years ago we decided to make the move towards uh, using a Web 2.0 kind of model for um, getting our uh, collections out there. Uh, we've managed to do this with the help of New Zealand Micrographics and their online interactive database platform Recollect, of which we've been one of the pioneer users. Uh, and this is the landing page of our Recollect site that you can see here. Uh, Chris Dempsey, I believe, spoke yesterday uh, about the new version that's about to come out soon. There's a lot more features. But anyway, Recollect. Um, as an interactive site, it's got a lot of features that are designed to invite user participation, crowdsourcing, that sort of thing. But it also has tools aimed at making your content more readily available for use. Um, and for example, the vast majority of the over 15,000 photographs we currently have on our site, and that's soon to go up to 19,000, uh, are available under a Creative Commons uh, 3.0 license. And you can see a little detail in the corner there that shows you what that looks like on an item page, and people just have to click the um, Actions tab and there'll be a download tool, and so they can easily download a high-resolution image of that. Um, move on to the final slide. Okay, here are some examples from one of our largest and most popular photograph collections. Um, Revel Jackson was a local photographer who documented Upper Hutt life during the 60s and 70s. Uh, we have over 8,000 of his wonder often wonderful and striking images available for download on our Recollect site. And Revel Jackson is still alive. He's in his 90s, but this is done with his full permission. Um, the kinds of common uses to which people put images like these seem to include things like framing prints for decorative use around their house or workplace or using them as illustrations for books and other publications, including websites. We've also re recently had some Revel Jackson images uh, acquired for use in a feature film. Um, some of these uses are obviously might be deemed commercial, which places them outside the terms of our Creative Commons license. However, we generally waive this restriction when requested because most of the projects don't involve significant profits and don't seem commercially exploitative, but the license means that people have to actually ask us for permission. Uh, we previously charged for permission to use our prints, uh, but this represented a very minor income stream for us and uh, involved administrative costs. And we feel that the very small loss of income here has been more than offset by the goodwill and publicity that taking an open content approach has generated. And also, of course, it's gratifying for us to see our collections being put to use, which is, after all, the whole point of preserving them in the first place. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fiona Gregson. I'm the third of the uh, Fionas in the session this afternoon. Um, I work in the media policy team of the Ministry for Culture and Heritage here in Wellington. Um, and in the media team, questions around copyright are really important in relation to media convergence and this balancing act between the public wanting to access the content they want uh, when they want it and the more traditional model business models that still operate, particularly in the screen industry. But um, one of my other tasks at the Ministry is thinking about how we might provide input to the review of the Copyright Act um, when that happens. And um, that led me to convening a group of people in the cultural sector who are really dealing with issues around the operation of the Act of, on a daily basis. Um, agencies such as Archives New Zealand, Alexander Turnbull Library of Film Archive, Te Papa. And um, one of the main things this group's ended up doing is a best practice project um, around attributing consistent and accurate um, right statements um, to um, digitised material online. Um, and this came about, we started looking at um, photographs that might be the same photograph on different agencies' websites, but we found there was different um, rights information there in relation to that photograph or it wasn't clear that the photograph might be, um, copyright might have expired, but the person still had to contact the institution to find out how they could use it. And we felt this could be um, made more, much more consistent. 
Um, so we've um, started a project looking at um, some World War I material taken by a man called Henry Armitage Sanders, who was the government's official photographer and he took some film footage on the Western Front. Um, and this material um, is held in several of the agencies around the working group. Um, and um, yeah, what we're, what we're doing is we've got a, a, a deadline of Anzac Day next year for getting um, all of the um, negatives um, digitised online, um, the ones that aren't already, and the same right statement attributed to each of those wherever they're found. I'm uh, Tom Rennie, I'm the Associate Publisher of Bridger Williams Books, I'm an independent publisher based in Wellington. Um, as I explained in my brief talk yesterday, we publish complex non-fiction works, uh, particularly a lot of history that are often heavily illustrated. Uh, typically these illustrations are central to the, the, the intellectual structure of these works. Um, at times they're even indispensable, um, particularly with Judith Binney's histories. Uh, one recent example is uh, Claudia Orange's new edition of Story of a Treaty, which had um, over 120 separate permissions clearances for this work um, and a lot of iwi permissions. Uh, but we also have a number of works that have far more uh, permissions for that for an individual work. Uh, BWB has always been scrupulous with its permissions clearance. Uh, I, over 30 years of publishing, um, I'm not aware that Bridget's ever encountered a permissions issue, which I think given the complexity of this space, is quite an achievement. Um, it also reflects the deep respect that BWB has uh, for the glam sector and their expertise as collectors, curators and rights holders. We are however still facing some significant challenges uh, with permissions, notably with clearances for our retro conversion work. This work involves taking over a hundred titles, uh, stretching back over 30 years of publishing, into a digital space and we're having to clear over 3,000 items for this. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, we are committed to uh, re-releasing these titles fully illustrated. We don't want to devalue these works by having to redact images. Um, but this means a number of our ebook releases are delayed until we can reach this stage. And a number of the, a couple of the issues that we're facing with these, firstly, um, revolves around the terms that were being offered or not offered um, by some institutions for digital usage. Uh, I started on this work back in 2011 and I started by preparing a broad spectrum uh, permissions request. Um, this was shaped around how the industry is going to be evolving over time and we took this approach simply because we felt it's the most honest declaration of where digital publishing is going to evolve and we saw it as a way that would potentially save costs um, across all parties. Happily, uh, a number of New Zealand institutions uh, have agreed to these terms and we're extremely grateful for that. Uh, but we're still having some issues and these are largely revolving around um, being granted only one ebook instance um, for a permission, which is not clear to me as to whether or not that permits books and browsers, uh, whether or not it permits database products, um, and whether or not it even permits different formats um, across different vendors. I mentioned yesterday that we're having to prepare essentially one ebook for each vendor now. Uh, we're being often only being offered New Zealand rights only, um, or alternatively world rights, but with a huge, sometimes unfeasible increase in the cost, which for me simply defeats the point of publishing digitally in the first place. Uh, we're often being granted a, a fixed term, which can be as short as five years for a permission. Um, and again, that makes little sense to me because there's no meaningful way that we in good faith can police that. And it, it runs counter to say us having to license material, uh, a complete work back to libraries who are requesting perpetual access for a work. Um, and then at times, not often, but at times we're also having uh, unachievable or idiosyncratic requests around DRM, such as having to reassure rights holders that we can't, that a user won't be able to sort of right click an image out of an ebook. Um, a few institutions have also seen the range of this initial request is extravagant. Um, some of them are quoting as high as $500 per image, which in terms of our retro conversion work, these are titles where often we expect they'll, they'll sell a handful of copies a year, many of them. We're, we're doing this for scholarly reasons, not for commercial reasons. Um, and those sorts of costs are plainly unfeasible for publishers in New Zealand or abroad. Um, so in these few, and I would emphasize few, uh, notable instances, we remain stuck between either agreeing 
to these what I see as disingenuous terms in terms of single instance usage or, or fixed usage, um, or not being able to include these items at all. And neither of those are acceptable for us, um, but I'm confident we're going to be able to reach agreement in these instances, and um, we, we hope this session might make some small contribution to, to advancing that. Thanks. Um, brilliant. So my name's Matt from Creative Commons Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, I'm not actually from the education sector, but I'm going to talk a wee bit about some of the work that um, Creative Commons has been doing in the education sector to encourage um, the development of open educational resources utilising some of the open materials that um, people on this panel have been opening up, but also many other institutions in New Zealand. Um, Creative Commons provides um, free licences to enable people to share works according to a range of restrictions. Um, and we have the rather lofty goal, you can see it on our website, of um, universal access to education and full participation in culture. And we actually take that quite seriously. And um, the good news is, is that it's happening. We're making progress. And by when I say we, I mean the International Creative Commons movement is making progress towards these aims. Um, we're making really fast progress in the last 18 months actually towards open education, open access to research, um, open government, and also open glam. And I see um, from my kind of perspective in between all those different open movements a real potential for different kinds of open material to be used together, especially for schools. I really see a potential for teachers to be reusing some of these open materials and making open educational resources using some of these high quality, high resolution images, uh, but not just images, all kinds of open materials that you guys are releasing. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I work in schools quite a lot. Um, the big copyright issue that I'm trying to address is that teachers don't hold copyright to their teaching resources. So if they share any resources online, they're technically infringing the copyright of their board of trustees, um, which is a ludicrous default, but we're doing our best to get schools one by one to adopt Creative Commons policies to ensure that teachers can legally share resources online and also for schools themselves to give an active um, statement that they encourage their teachers sharing educational resources. Um, but the only, the, the, the real message I want to send is that there's a massive, massive potential for schools to be using much, 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 much more stuff, much more of the glam sector stuff than they currently do. Um, and I, will, I think that potential will be realised in the next five or so years um, and some of the steps that these institutions have been taking are getting us much closer to that goal. Um, we're going to kick off with a set of questions that I'd come up with um, and then, so that'll take, I don't know, 20 minutes or so and then we'll open up for, to the audience for questions. Um, so I'll kick off with, um, and whoever wants to start can start, but um, why did you choose the open licence approach that you did choose and what were the decision factors? Go. <laughs> One up. Um, from Te Papa, for Te Papa's perspective, it's been, um, it wasn't really a choose, it was uh, what I think is an idea that whose time has arrived and been here a while. Um, but just to say also, um, in preparing notes for this, I looked back at Te Papa's progress and um, I wrote up the notes and thought, geez, this looks really organised and planned, and it wasn't. Um, There's a lot of trying and a lot of failure and a lot of trying again, and it really hasn't been easy, especially for a large organisation with a lot of competing tensions and priorities, and that continues. Um, the way I've looked at it, uh, and the way we've sort of brought it forward, is by pruning out ring fencing and parking anything that looks hard and just focusing on the really low, easy fruit to deal with. And um, luckily with a collection of our size, that means we can be in a position of being able to commit to what seems, can sometimes seems quite a small amount of 10,000 images a year for three years. But from my perspective, I see that as a stake in the ground for us to work on our processes. Um, and I see that as a bit of a trial and embedding it into work practices so that we can go, grow from there rather than no, that's it, the, the, you know, we've reached the finish line. I don't think that that's the case at all. I think we need to continue on with it. Um, I'll just say, uh, once we decided to go the open content um, route, and that for us flowed on from the decision to do the Web 2.0 thing, um, taking the, the actual choice of license was pretty straightforward for us. Uh, 
the Creative uh, Commons 3.0 attribution non-commercial license um, covered what we needed. We needed two things. One, what we were basic, what was basically important for us was some kind of acknowledgement and recognition for both our institution and our donors uh, for having made this material available. Um, but the other thing was uh, the non-commercial aspect, which as I said before, we, we do waive uh, depending on the circumstances, but uh, it was deemed necessary you know, for us to retain some kind of control over use and uh, prevent inappropriate, you know, wholesale appropriation of work and um, in the name of some kind of profit-making enterprise so that, you know, somebody could take the entire Rebel Jackson collection and put it in a book and uh, so this, this stops that, but um, so those, yeah, the 3.0 seem to cover the two main concerns that we had. I think if I can add um, to these other two um, responses, I think for Auckland Art Gallery, as I alluded to before, we're kind of at the start of that road. Um, currently, if you look at any out of um, copyright content on our website, it just says copyright expired. We don't currently use any Creative Commons licenses. Um, similarly, if an artwork is in copyright, it does say copying restrictions apply, and people um, do need to kind of go through a slightly convoluted route on our website to figure out how to request co um, permission to reproduce those um, artworks. So I think um, we're really keen to kind of move towards um, ideas about Creative Commons licenses. Um, the, my colleagues that I have spoken to um, do seem really keen, um, so I think it is just um, continuing on that project. I think our um, main difficulty is that currently we don't have anyone working on copyright full time. Um, it's part of several people's jobs um, and so because it's split between people like that it is slightly disjointed. Um, I deal with copyright at the point of acquisition. Um, we have a reproductions coordinator who look, looks after the requests um, and we do have um, sort of marketing staff and other people within the institution who do all sorts of bits and pieces, plus our um, research librarians who um, in the past have managed copyright and have done an amazing job of research. So we're kind of in a, in a bit of a tricky place um, and as I say, hopefully um, in time to come you'll sort of see uh, better content on our website um, and more clear instructions on how people can reuse content. In relation to our World War I um, project, um, we couldn't use a Creative Commons licence because that material was already in the public domain, but in terms of uh, uh, what's been helpful in that process was getting a legal opinion that um, said black and white that it was in the public domain, that Crown Copyright had expired, and then we could then take that to the agencies and talk about what's the right statement, and we're looking at the moment at no known copyright restrictions. So what has the biggest hurdle been? and how did you overcome it? <laughs> I'll start that one. Um, I don't know about hurdle, but uh, by far and away the biggest issue for us is, is orphan works. Um, the works where it's not clear what the copyright status of. Um, we, as I said, the Rebel Jackson collection doesn't fall in that. Another major collection we have relating to uh, photos from the Upper Hut Leader doesn't fall in that either. But we still have a substantial amount of works that we, we just simply don't know the copyright status of. And um, we kind of, um, you know, a small institution like our own, um, we just simply don't have the time and resources to go through and uh, check and, and go through the very lengthy, exhaustive process of, of making sure copyright is clear on items that are past a certain date. Um, so, you know, basically, and I really want to stress here, I don't want to give the impression that we've taken a cavalier kind of like, oh, whatever approach to copyright. Uh, we have identified the uh, most problematic-ish ones and anything that looked like it's, you know, could be a problem we haven't put a co Creative Commons license on. But the vast majority of our collection, we just made the judgment call that these are items that even though we weren't sure, you know, local photograph collections, that sort of thing, we didn't think people were going to be bothered by it. We didn't think copyright claims were going to be made. And so the decision was made to make those, these available. Uh, and uh, otherwise, this, this content's just locked up. 
And um, so, yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, so that's not exactly a hurdle that we've overcome, <laughs> but that's the way we've dealt with the problem. And as I said, it's not, we're not being cavalier, uh, but it's different than, I appreciate the differences with other institutions and larger institutions and reputations and that sort of thing, and the reason for the extremely cautious, risk-averse uh, kind of approach that tends to predominate, uh, whereby it's very hard to find images that you could use post-1916 or something. Uh, but um, yeah, we've, we've made this decision kind of to uh, you know, make stuff available uh, as long as we were felt pretty confident that there were no claims against it. hurdle for us, uh, I would say at the very start of this, back when we, 2005, 2006, when I think we first started looking at rights in the collection, was making sure that we had good tools. Um, we do a lot of rights research at Te Papa, and the worst thing that can happen is for somebody to have to go and do that rights research all over again six months later. So from um, my perspective, EMU has been an absolute godsend. We have a really great rights module associated with our collection information, and it allows us, to, not just me, but also other researchers as well, to track copyright research and to, def, you know, to, to record proof when we've found it of when something is definitely out of copyright. We also have a large orphaned works problem and as soon as it has orphaned works it gets parked. As soon as there's iwi relationship issues it gets parked. As soon as there's nudity issues it gets parked. As soon as there's um, any kind of images of dead people, parked. It's If it's a problem park it, move on to the stuff that's going to be easy to release. I'm, I'm looking at that and thinking, I'll release what, we'll release what we can right now to the best of our ability, and then once that's done and we've got it embedded in our work process for the easy stuff, we can go back and look at the hard problems later. This actually leads on really well to what um, I'm going to say, which is um, what we challenge that's come up is what we do when an institution um, wants to um, withhold um, some work that is in the public domain but for other reasons of sensitivity such as iwi or um, dead people being portrayed in the images. And um, for us it's been around not allowing those sensitivities to stop the whole collection being withheld. So um, thinking about perhaps a statement that the institution can attribute to that material saying why it's not being released but then releasing the remainder. So we're still getting the material, most of the material released. kind of a sideways um, response, uh, not so much about releasing content with an open licence, but what I'd like to comment on is um, the differences with art collections from other types of collection. Um, and I think for us, one of the interesting um, things that has come through um, dealing with copyright is um, talking with artists about copyright, and um, not only artists, but also copyright holders. Um, and it can be a really great opportunity as an institution to talk with people and to kind of educate them about what it means to release content and um, what there is, you know, what the possibilities are and why it's good to um, release content from an authoritative source. Um, as one example, uh, we have uh, two artists um, who are now deceased and their family manages the copyright and they have actually, the family has given us permission to um, open out reproductions, um, I think to A1 or A0 size, because they're really happy about how we've managed um, reproduction requests and how we sort of look after that for them. And um, I think that's a really successful example of how you um, can work with copyright holders to kind of get a more open result. That's great. And so have you achieved what you wanted to? Has anything surprised you or is there anything that you would do differently? Just to be bold, I'd really love it if we all shared our copyright holder information. That would make my life significantly easier. <laughs> um, one of the things I find is that in doing this job for, for five, six years is the community I've built up and all the people who I know hold the information to the addresses and contact details for artists, artists' estates, artists' granddaughters, artists' nieces and nephews and various... You know, there are times when... Um, 
things have been bound up regarding copyright. I mean, this hasn't got anything to do with open. This is the stuff that's actually in copyright. Um, where it's been a real battle to try and find somebody to get permission and take it from being an orphaned work into something that we're actually allowed to reproduce online at all. Um, you know, like you say, with the art collections, you respect an artist's choice not to have their work um, up on online. That's an artistic, you know, they're the rights holder. You have to respect that. Um, but for the most part, it's it's making sure you do the due diligence and um, because the last thing you want is to be in a position where you're upsetting people without knowing. I think um, adding to your comment um, about that, we um, at Auckland Art Gallery, we're often in touch with other institutions around New Zealand sharing um, copyright information and that, um, uh, as Victoria sort of said, it's a really um, positive relationship. You know, you know that you can email a colleague at Te Papa or at Christchurch Art Gallery or other institutions to go help. Um, do you know who the copyright holder is for such and such? Um, and that's um, super useful. <laughs> yes, and um, another thing that I, um, I ought to slightly plug is that um, recently uh, Auckland Art Gallery has worked together with um, Christchurch Art Gallery and I think also Ted Papa yeah. on the New Zealand Artists Names mm -hmm. Database. Um, which is a pretty amazing resource. You know, the, um, basically it's a list of um, all of the known New Zealand artists, their place and um, place of birth, date of birth, place of death, date of death, um, and also who holds a bit more information about that artist. So if any of you are doing research into um, copyright of artists, um, that can be a really great um, starting point. Um, I don't recall the website off the top of my head, but I'm sure you can Google it. Someone will tweet it, hopefully. Yeah. Find New Zealand artist. Yeah. Find nzartist.org.nz. <laughs> oh, they, they're going to be asking some questions soon. Um, yeah, uh, just picking Victoria's, um, Victoria's point, uh, I totally agree that, you know, the worst thing is to offend people or upset people without meaning to. And uh, certainly, I'll be honest that when I, when we launched the site, and uh, I, which was over a year ago, I had a lot of sleepless nights, and I actually worried about have you know, do people know about this open content thing? Are we going to get in trouble for something? Are people going to be upset? Uh, well, it's been over a year now, and. Uh, I'm a bit surprised, but we haven't had a single issue with that. And we've had a lot of publicity. Uh, our collection is available through Digital New Zealand, has been out there. I've had three requests during that whole time to remove material. Uh, those requests were, none of them involved copyright. They were people, they were all involved photos from the newspaper that had been publicly available, but because of something that had happened, I won't go into detail on these people's lives, they didn't want these photos being made available online. And I removed them immediately, uh, apologized for any upset that caused them, and they were more than happy with that situation. So um, without wanting to jinx things, uh, if you say what I've been surprised by, I've been surprised by how smoothly things have gone so far, because we realized we were taking a bit of a risk here, and uh, we just didn't want to be, you know, uh, put in the embarrassing situation of, of uh, having to take lots of material down. Um, I'd just like to comment one more thing about orphaned works. Um, after Te Papa does due diligence and gives it its best shot at trying to find a copyright holder, if we have tried and failed, we do actually put the work up in collections online. Uh, the reason we do that is to try and um, usher out of the woodwork the copyright holder. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There has been, in the, since 2006, there's been three instances where that has happened. On two occasions, they didn't even know they were the copyright holder. They came back to us and said, I'm so glad to see Grandad's whatever. Um, and we negotiated a licence retrospectively. Um, and the one occasion that where um, the rights holder was a little bit upset about it, um, an apology, a takedown, and um, negotiations afterwards solved the problem with no, you know, it actually built the relationship. Mm -hmm. So um, for those of you with worries about orphaned works, do some due diligence if you can, when you can, and put them up. Uh, and this question's especially for Fiona, Fiona G. 
Fiona Gregson. Um, so she, so you're trying to work with multiple organisations to come to basically consensus about copyright statements or licensing statements. Um, that must be a little bit of a challenge. How's that going? Um, it has been quite slow progress, I have to say. Um, and I think part of that is that what we're trying to do is something of a first um, among a, a sector, trying to agree a statement that everyone will, will use. Um, so it's sort of slow steps, but um, I have to say we're on track in terms of our deadline of Anzac Day next year. Um, and I feel confident that we'll, we'll get there and that we thought we'd start with public domain material because that would be the low hanging fruit like you talked about before, Victoria, um, as, a, as, a, as a first go um, and then um, perhaps it will lead on to looking at um, material that's within copyright term. Yeah. And um, so, and this is for everyone at the table because you two might have an uh, answer to this question as well and I've got more questions for, for Tom and Matt, don't worry. Um, <laughs> is, is there an inspiring institution here or internationally that you've regular, regularly gone to as a successful model for open content or you know, just an organisation that you admire that has helped? Um, I'd like to say Digital New Zealand, um, and the reason I say that is, by golly, have they pushed us. They have um, been really great advocates and great people to spring ideas off. Um, essentially, we wouldn't have probably gone to the three tiers of all rights reserved, Creative Commons licence and no known copyright restriction statements had they not pushed us with the... Um, opening of Digital New Zealand and the Coming Home Memory Maker project. That was our first trial in terms of using three statements. And for me, that was, um, while it was only 100 objects and it, it took us a while to get, it, get the Memory Maker stuff, um, working with the statements on um, collections online, it was actually the start of prompting us towards that. We were thinking about it, but it was taking a while, and that gave us a really great impetus to just get on and do it and we're still working on um, it. We're basically very grateful for any institutions that's met our digital usage. Um, the one in particular that's stood out for us is, is ATL. Um, and they, we submitted a huge uh, permissions request to them. It was a couple of thousand images, I think. And um, I know their team did a huge amount of work on that. And for me, it's interesting because I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on where they are, but my understanding is they're not necessarily an open institution in terms of where they are present, but they um, met all our requirements and um, did a huge job for us. So I know the team at BWB is really grateful for that. I know that, um, and I think Mark might be in the audience, but National Library and Alexander Turnbull Library are working on their reuse policy at the moment, and um, it's, it's imminent. I think it's, we're nearly there, so, um, so look out for that, and I think it'll be a, a great policy for organisations to look at and, and maybe copy and use or um, remix themselves. For me, it's actually been to Papa, and um, things like the goal around 10,000 images um, for high resolution download and the um, risk management approach to Orphan Works, we're actually putting material out there. Um, and as well as that, I really like the New Zealand On Screen website and um, the, the processes they go through to clear the rights to iconic New Zealand um, content is quite admirable. As well as that, they release their own clips, interview clips, um, under Creative Commons licences, which are great. Well, just quickly, I mean, I don't mean to keep sucking up to people on the panel, but um, <laughs> um, De Papa and Digital New Zealand have been... Um, Digital New Zealand is extremely supportive of Creative Commons, always has been. Um, and I learnt most of what I know about what goes on in the glam sector from um, a conversation I had with Victoria Leachman when I wrote a case study for Creative Commons way back when. So definitely to Papa and, and Digital New Zealand as well. Internationally, um, the Open Knowledge Foundation are pretty good on some of the stuff. They're getting better. Um, they've launched an open glam project, um, which is a way of kind of coordinating some of the information around open glam um, in Europe and North America specifically, though it's, it's intended to be an international project, so I would, if you're looking for news about open glam institutions internationally, there's a public domain discussion list and there's a lot of information that they put out, including the Public Domain Review, which is an excellent public domain publication that you guys should all check out. Okay, questions for Tom and Matt now, we'll put them in the hot seat. So has access to open cultural 
content made a difference to your your industry yet? Has it time? Has it saved time? Has it saved money? Frustration? Any other factor? Um, open open access is having quite a bit of impact on social on scholarly publishing generally, but that's a, a separate issue. Um, for us. Uh, the short answer is no. I mean, I've, I spoke to my team earlier today on the number of permissions we've cleared over the last year to two years. It's been under a CC licence and there was one, um, and that was from Stats New Zealand. Uh, that was a graph for an inequality book. Um, so uh, there's an issue there for me perhaps about um, if, if stuff moving to this open space is, is understandably the low-hanging fruit, we're perhaps higher up the tree, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, and we've otherwise found that you know, as I said before, ATL fantastic with our with our digital permissions usage. So for us, it's not always an issue of whether or not something is open. The immediate issue for us is the terms of the license and, and the cost. Um, so in that respect, it, it hasn't had a significant impact thus far for BWB. Um, oh, just with the proviso that I'm not from the education sector necessarily, so I don't want to make too many overarching claims. Um, but I will anyway. The, um, I, don't, I, see, I think with the glam sector and the education sector are both in a pretty early stage of development in terms of open. Um, and we should always keep in mind um, that we're talking about a pretty fundamental shift in how people access and reuse cultural objects. It's a pretty major thing that's happening. Um, so I, again, I, I point to the massive potential in the education sector. I think there's a lot of students out there reusing um, stuff from Digital New Zealand and other places. And there's a lot of teachers that are starting to incorporate it in teaching resources. I think some copyright issues are still pretty difficult and some of the usage statements on Glam Institution's websites are still a little bit vague for some teachers. You can't expect every teacher in New Zealand, the 50,000 plus teachers in New Zealand to have the same expertise in copyright as someone like Tom who works in this day to day. Um, you really can't, you, that kind of copyright knowledge is never gonna happen. So you really need to make it trivially easy for people to access stuff, reuse stuff, and know that they're doing it legally. Um, because if there are any issues around um, the legality of reuse, most teachers are gonna do absolutely nothing because most teachers are really interested, obviously, in, in staying, um, ensuring that what they do is legal, but also passing on that kind of legal practice to their students. And so, and you've kind of started answering this, Matt, um, so what do you really wish would happen in this area and what would really make a difference in your in industry and area? Um, I mean, I, I want to stress again that we're already, you know, we're very happy with um, the relationship we have with, with the GLAM sector in terms of our image licensing. Um, and uh, I think for us, the question again really is just, um, we'd love to see a bit more sophistication around the, the, the nature of the terms being issued. Um, so that, you know, is looking at things like finer distinctions between uh, an independent New Zealand publisher and um, a, a commercial entity that's larger or from offshore perhaps in terms of the, the terms being issued, um, more of an emphasis on whether or not an image is being licensed for a, a backlist conversion work or for a frontlist title. Um, we'd like to see more sophistication around the, the nature of the usage being granted in terms of um, how it's uh, been represented online, whether or not you know, it's this idea of a single instance of an ebook, or whether or not it's a more distributed online presence. Um, and we'd also, you know, would like to see more of a discussion and engagement about what is achievable on DRM if a rights holder actually wants us to apply DRM. Um, because at the moment there's, to some extent, a disconnect between some of the requirements on DRM versus what we as a publisher are able to apply in the supply chain. Um, but what I have been struck by, and again, I'm not an expert in terms of where rights holders are, are evolving, but the, the Hargraves report in the UK, um, 2010, um, led to the development of the Copyright Hub over there. And what was striking for me in that development was that there was a specific focus on um, scale and volume of usage and small and medium-sized enterprises. And for me, that focus, particularly on sort of medium-sized enterprises, matches the realities of what we meet and what we're able to achieve as, a, as an independent publisher. Um, now again, I don't know all the details on that. I know it's a, it's a, uh, the, the Copyright Hub is something that's an ongoing process and I think is still subject to review. Um, but it's that sort of degree of granularity and sophistication I'd like to see coming through in, in, in the terms being offered to us, more so really than issues around openness at this stage. It's more about reaching a midpoint that allows us to 
reuse these works in our digital titles. Um, yeah, so just to expand on what I said before, I think it really does need to be trivially easy. I, I think the intended audience, the kind of the, the kind of base level intended audience should be a seven year old, should be able to access and reuse the stuff and um, reference it properly, which sounds ridiculous, but we've just run um, Digital New Zealand to run Mix and Mash and we've had seven year olds do that. Um, Creative Commons is a bit guilty of this as well, um, and we are developing tools to make it trivially easy to provide attribution on images, because a lot of people don't do it properly, and that's presumably because it's a little bit too difficult. Um, but I think if, if it can become trivially easy to access, reuse, and reference properly works in cultural and heritage institutions, you're much more likely to see uptake in the education sector, where, again, you can't expect people to go through the kinds of processes or even read the right statements, um, like Tom obviously does quite a lot. <laughs> and so if there's one particular piece of content or group of content that could be opened up and make a real difference for your areas of interest, what would it be? Uh, well, images, of course. Um, but I, I don't really feel qualified to say that it should be opened up, per se. I mean, if, if, if the institution is happy to open it up, then that's great. Um, I. I, you know, I know that there are financial imperatives for some of these institutions, and I don't feel like I'm in a position to sit here and say that this material should be opened up without a, a finer understanding of those of those commercial imperatives. Um, it seems to me that there's perhaps a, a tension here between this desire for openness and and whether or not some of these institutions are having financial imperatives placed on them um, from higher up. I don't know. So. I'd love to see these images opened up that would allow us to bring you know, all these 3,000 rights through for our backlist, um, but I'm very cautious in, in saying that that's a, something that can be done simply, and um, I know that there's great complexity throughout all of this process. Um, I'd, I'd add one image, uh, one, one piece of content. I would say um, it'd be really good to see more film and TV opened up, though I know the rights issues around film and TV are super complicated. Um, but that would be really useful and interesting for people in schools to, re, to be able to reuse, especially stuff from kind of, there's kind of a, a bit of a black hole in the middle of the 20th century for a lot of this stuff. And um, if it's too hard to open up some of that stuff, if um, I'd be really keen in ensuring that we don't reproduce that problem for the 21st century as well. So maybe putting in place policies within cultural funding institutions to ensure that um, publicly funded cultural works don't get dropped into that black hole where you can't really access it, you can't really reuse it even though it was publicly funded in the first place, just try and ensure that that doesn't happen again for the next century. That would be um, my hope. Brilliant. Okay, time for the audience questions. Hopefully you've got some. We've got some questions out there? Great. I just wanted the uh, museum uh, panelists to comment about what do you do when you loan to each other with regard to intellectual property and the sorts of rights and requirements that you place upon each other or have experience from other museums placing on you? The loan agreement of items. Uh, the loan, the, yeah, that's a good one. Um, the loan agreement from Tapapa says no photography of the item. If you want to use a photograph of that particular item, you have to go back to our picture library and um, negotiate a licence and possibly pay for it. Um, at Auckland Art Gallery, we, um, in our loan agreement, it generally states that people can, um, the public can photograph um, collection items as long as it's not for um, commercial purposes. Um, and again, if people want to use, um, if the other institution wants to use an image of that collection item for um, publicity purposes, that just goes through uh, reproductions um, side of things. Thanks. Um, the issue of uh, artists not wanting their images used online, is that because they're worried about unauthorised reuse? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. In some cases, it's a it's a, um, a wish of the artist for the work to be experienced in the flesh as opposed to in an online environment. So it's a philosophical um, standpoint. Yeah, it's one that I happen to disagree with violently. 
Um, um, because, I mean, I come from but Australia. But it's their work. Sorry? <laughs> so if it's, that's the whole point. It's their work, so we don't have any rights to reproduce it without their permission. I know it's their work, but I mean, you hang their work in the gallery, don't you? Yes, indeed. Yeah. And it's physically accessible, but not digitally. I think it's only to people who can come to Wellington. And in Australia, I'm this not, is much more I'm of a look, problem. I'm not arguing with you at all. I, I personally think that if you're not online, you're invisible. But um, that's not the perception of some of our artists, and we collect from a lot of them. I think as a um, as an as an institution that collects art, you have to um, really respect your relationship with artists, um, and certainly. Um, as Victoria said, if, even if you don't personally agree with that opinion, you've really got to. You're working with these artists, so you know you've got to do what they, um, what they really feel. I think um, one example that um, a colleague of mine told me about was um, an artist who had um, not given permission for any of their um, artworks to re be reproduced online. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, met with this artist, and just in, in talking to them. Um, did a Google search on their name and then did an image search um, and showed them all of the um, images of their artworks that were online and managed to convince the artist that, well, you know, why not have the authoritative um, image, you know, a really nice high quality image with really good information about that artwork, why not allow that? And as a result of that conversation, um, the artist changed their mind and did allow the um, the images to be reproduced. So, you know, it, it's, it's something that does change over time with artists as well. And I think certainly um, given where we are now with, um, with the web and images um, and content, I think there is a greater understanding from artists about what it means to um, have their art, images of their artworks reproduced online and how it can be a really positive thing. That's a really good question. Um, I will feed that back to um, my colleagues in the research library whose project that is. Thanks for that. And just, just more generally on that topic of intellectual property of the organisations around metadata, is, have the panel got any comments on that and why metadata created by um, um, cultural and heritage organisations can't all be open, open metadata or creative copyright? Creative Commons licensed? Um, from Te Papa's perspective, we were focusing on images we haven't got there yet, and it is on the list. Because it would make a big difference for Digital New Zealand. And what? <laughs> One last question. Hey, um, so I, I just. Um, really quick question. We've, we've, we've been talking about kind of copyright and, and, and these kind of issues, and I wondered, we've described what is quite a complex situation we find ourselves in and it's difficult and hard work. Um, what, now that we've seen at least a draft of the TPPA, I wondered if you organisationally or individually have any comments around what that may or may not do, if it's going to make your lives easier or worse. Is there any comments you have about that, given that we've at least seen a draft of it in the last few weeks? <laughs> Go, Victoria. Um, I can comment on it personally. I'm not speaking for my organisation when I say this, but it's going to make my life harder. Um, really quickly, um, Creative Commons HQ just released, this is not specific to the TPPA, but they released a statement in support of copyright reform, and these are very broad, um, quite obvious um, reforms that Creative Commons HQ thought were necessary, such as don't extend the copyright act, um, term, that kind of thing, and broader fair use provisions internationally. Um, it's not a very controversial statement, but that is a statement that it has some relevance to the TPP. I think we'd better wrap up there because there's hordes of people coming in. Um, thank you all for your time and your interesting perspectives and experiences, and I hope that some of you in the audience have been in inspired to take a deeper leap or um, start a journey or at least come and talk to one of us about our experiences um, and 
Thank you. And if you could all thank our wonderful panellists, that would be great. <laughs>